What say you, Richard Ellett Murdoch? Are you guilty or not guilty of the felonies wherein you stand and die? Not guilty. How shall you be tried? By God and my country. The exact time when Paul and Maggie Murdoch were murdered. At the end of the investigation, it was obvious. I'm not here to work with them. Okay. And the whole point is to have this not fall into the wrong hands. This case is unique, it's unprecedented in South Carolina history. We were grateful for that sentence. As Emily Limehouse pointed out in the courtroom, the judge is allowed to stack sentences. It's not particularly common, but we do think it was warranted in this case. He stated his reasons in open court really hard to disagree with. How much of that 40 years will he have to do? Uh, I don't know for sure. If he'll do any in federal court, it all depends on what happens to the murder convictions, obviously. Welcome to Unsolved South Carolina, the Murdoch's Murders, Money and Mystery. We are here to talk about Alec Murdoch's federal sentencing, which just happened in the past week. I am here with, of course, our exclusive legal analyst, Charlie Condon, our South Carolina's former attorney general. We're also here with Drew Tripp and myself, Ann Emerson. And thank you so much for joining us. We wanted to, of course, this has been a monumental sentencing, really, because the whole idea of the federal sentencing from the way we understand it was a backstop to all to any chance that uh, Alec Murdoch would ever walk a free man again. Uh, Charlie and I were both at the sentencing. Drew was hearing about it as it was as it was happening. Um, it was it was an extraordinary day again because we had there was so much at stake in a way because everyone has sort of been living under this can I call it a fear that one day that Alec Murdoch could get out because these convictions could get overturned? And when I say fear, that's coming, of course, from the prosecution um, and not from his side of the table. No. Uh, so what did you think, Charlie, when at this at this federal sentencing? Was it what you were expecting? Uh, yes and no. I mean, the, the yes in terms of uh, I set the stage, what was at stake, but I did not expect the government asked for a 30-year sentence, and it seemed to me that Judge Gergel, since he gave notice that he was asking for what's called a variance from the sentencing guidelines, that he was going to be strict. But it was, I was really surprised the government asked for 30, and for the, have, have the sentencing authority, the federal judge, to say, no, let's throw another 10 years on top of that. And he compared the case to Bernie Madoff's case, which I think is an apt analogy, but that surprised me. That, went, that was that strict of a sentence. And I think it's, uh, I venture to say, that's going to be the strictest white collar crime sentence in the history of South Carolina, I'm, I'm thinking. Did he, give any, did he give any insights during the sentencing uh, as to his reasoning or what he was, uh, did he elaborate any more? That, that is something that I have that, I, the, you, there's, the ability to read between the lines, but not being in there and not, and of course, oh, yeah, the federal yeah. federal yeah. court federal court not having cameras. What what was his rationale? Did well, you you had a lot of this inner interchange because the defense attorney uh, Griffin went through what he thought were comparable white collar crimes. Mm -hmm. The recent sentencing of Friedman up in uh, I guess New York City. He, he listed two or three others. He said these ranges are. 15, 20 years, that's what we're asking for. And Judge Gurgle interrupted him and said, uh, leave one out. And the one he left out was Bertie Madoff sentencing. And then he went through a long uh, discussion about his colleague on the federal bench. He went through how serious that crime was, and therefore that's how he got, I think it was 100, maybe 144 100, years? Yeah, yeah, years. it was it's upwards of 140 years. So he actually made a little bit of quip. At one point in the sentencing, saying, I guess in a way I'm, I'm lenient because I'm comparing that to Bernie Madoff. I'm not giving him 140 years or so. I'm giving him 40 years. So that was the discussion. It was quite the, the back and forth. And um, it, was, uh, it was dramatic, I would say. Well, it was. And it was also, you know, one thing Gergel said, I had written it down that, you know, the list of when he was sentencing Alec, Murdoch, he said, the list of thefts included your remarkable combination of extremely vulnerable 
paraplegic, motherless children, grieving widowers. Access to these funds was made in a position of trust as an attorney for people who put faith in the defendant. This was reprehensible conduct and deserves serious sanctions. So Gurgal knew where he was going with this, right? He knew where he was going with this when he got there. There's no way this language just showed up in the... Am I right? No, I don't, I don't agree with that. And, and you know, I, he was a classmate of mine at Duke Law School. Judge Gurgel was really you know, intelligent. And I did notice that he had, you could say four or five pages that he read Absolutely, from when yeah. he sentenced. So I'm assuming he had his law clerks busy. He was busy preparing. And I'm assuming also that nothing at the hearing changed his mind where he was headed with this, with a really, really strict sentence. And he also sent a real message to attorneys. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I think, has been underreported. He made a big point of saying that he felt he had a responsibility to other lawyers in South Carolina and indeed the country to let them know that if you entertain any such behavior as this former lawyer went through, that you're going to get such a sentence and should get such a sentence. So he wanted to use the word general deterrence. And so in sentencing um, theory, you have this specific deterrence where you're specifically deterring the person that you're sentencing, which in this case would be defendant Murdoch. But there's also this general deterrence where on top of him, you want to deter others. And he relied very heavily on general deterrence of lawyers in particular uh, for his very strict sentence. Well, and that's, it takes me to that the planning behind this as well. Um, we knew that he had filed an upward variance mm -hmm. before we even got there. Right. Um, there was a lot of filings. There was a flurry of activity going on mm -hmm. right before before this federal well, sentence. Yeah, that was fascinating to me too because um, this is a little bit complicated, but well, how this got mooted was so interesting because before the sentencing hearing started, they were in chambers. A mm -hmm. uh, very punctual judge, 10 o'clock, well, no show at 10 o'clock. Everyone was in chambers. It came out about 20 minutes later. I, I think I, I looked at the clock and I want to say it was about 16 minutes later. 16 minutes. They, were, yeah. they were in there. So obviously the that's discussion, a long time. A long time because obviously what had happened, when we set the stage here, is that the government filed a motion to hold the defendant in breach of the plea agreement for flunking oligraphs. And the defense was objecting to that. And the reason that was important because the plea agreement had the sentence running concurrently, that is at the same time and not consecutively. And so the defense wanted it to be concurrent. So Judge Garo came out, and it's pretty obvious to me in chambers that he said, I'm going to sentence him con concurrently. Mm -hmm. So there's no need to worry about the plea agreement being breached or not. And he later made a comment he didn't give much stock to polygraphs anyway. So that had been mooted. And so the defense got up, which was surprising as well talk about surprises, and withdrew their motion mm -hmm. to counter the government's motion to hold a breach because it had been mooted, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It wasn't important. And so that shortened, I anticipated the hearing going for a pretty long time, right. two or three hours, yeah. but since that was all important. So we had that off the table. So at the beginning you thought, well, he's going to run it concurrently. Maybe it's not going to be that long of a sentence, and maybe the defense would get what they wanted. Oh, no. Oh, contrary. They did not get what they wanted. He got a really strict, long sentence. And if there's any way that the defense can overturn the murder conviction with him having to serve a state prison sentence, so roughly, we think about 20 years or so? Um, okay. Yeah, yes. Uh, right now we're looking at, uh, well, he got sentenced to 27 years in state prison for stealing the 12 million mm -hmm. over 10 years. Mm -hmm. The plea deal reduced that to 22 crimes. Mm -hmm. 101. Right. And I think <laughs> financial yeah. crimes right. um, got that down. So it was like 22 is what we were talking about. Court. Right. And so the question, I guess, was for, for Murdoch was, mm -hmm. okay, well, if you're going to run it concurrent, then then that's not bad. Like I can probably still walk no, out. Yeah. No net time at it. Right. Except right. that the, it's 40. Yeah, it's 40. So he, no he gets on the federal system. He can get some good time off. I think it's 50 something days per year or so. Anywhere you look at this, he's going to be in prison until, unless he's an octave, unless he gets to his like late 90s, mm -hmm. he's in prison. So, so that's okay. So, I wanted to talk to his defense about that mm -hmm. because I wanted to understand where they were coming in with that. Yeah, What's the know. hope? Like, uh, where's the light at the end of the tunnel yeah. for Alec Murdoch yeah, at this point? We're in a defensive standpoint. Right well, I guess there's the First Step Act, which would in essence, lower the time again. The federal prosecutors, you know, are seeing that some of their their cases, some of these um, convictions are, are getting lessened considerably. Mm -hmm. 
But the trick here is where does he spend his time? And right now he spends his time in state mm -hmm. and then those extra 20 years, right? Um, then those 20 years may be eligible for this First Step Act mm -hmm. where they, on good behavior and everything, mm -hmm. would maybe lessen it. So that's, that was the hope. Of course, all of this doesn't matter right now because there's two murder convictions that keep him in for two life sentences right now. Exactly. So that is their first major hurdle, is they've got to appeal this conviction for the double murders. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, that, that will be happening in the next week. I see. They're gonna have to go ahead and appeal that. Is there any point in appealing the federal, uh, like appealing I federally? I mean, you can, you're allowed to, but I didn't see any grounds of, given the long dissertation that Jeff Gergel had, what, five pages, and he made all sorts of Find these rulings. I think that's going to be a bulletproof sentence, and he knew that it was going to be uh, looked at closely. I'm sure if they look at it closely, his order is going to cover all the potential appeal grounds. I don't think there's going to be much hope there. Uh, missing money too. What about interesting too? About missing money is very interesting. Big point of six million missing. That, and that's something I, I wanted to s segue into is uh, Charlie. You you mentioned the the effect of the sentence as a deterrent on other lawyers and sort of the position from which Judge Gerbel was approaching it and trying to send that message. And that was something going into the sentencing that the government showed their hand on a little bit is like, hey, we've got this, you still got $6 million unaccounted for. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Murdoch was not truthful with us about the potential of another attorney's involvement in his schemes. Mm -hmm. So what new ground did we cover in the hearing on those, on those specific topics? Did they, did we get any more enlightenment? I mean, we know that there were, we, we talked about the polygraph and that ended up, as you said, Judge Gerbel didn't put a whole lot of stock in the polygraph, which is by all accounts and what you read on those, it's great, but uh, it's great that he did. Uh, it's hard to see people kind of range in how they address polygraphs from just pure bunk pseudoscience to unreliable at best. And then right. others, it's like they, they do have their purpose and they are useful investigative tools. That All that said, he, he says he's not going to put much stock in. And so what then were we able to mm. get how where where did we end up going on those two issues that the government brought up pre-sentencing about the uh other attorney yeah, and the missing money i i really feel like the fact that dick hart pooping wasn't there we missed a lot of potential information coming out didn't, didn't you think he did well, be more loquacious than that's you why i felt like i had to kind mm. of catch mm. back up with the defense about mm. this a little bit about what was really going on mm. but but what they did say in court about that was that you know the, one of the reasons they said he lied on his polygraph was, from what I could gather, from what Emily Linehouse was arguing, um, Murdoch had remained adamant as did his attorneys that all these funds were spent on drugs. Right. And it didn't add up. It didn't add up because the financials didn't make sense. Right. It didn't add up because he claimed he'd been using the same amount of drugs since 2008, yet the laundry escalated by millions mm -hmm. in the late 2019 to 2020. Mm -hmm. So they caught him in this sort of a lie, lie <laughs> in, during the polygraph, which was one of the reasons that they were looking at that six million. So where's the six million? They that is that is still being investigated, from what we understand. As is this unnamed co-defendant. Um, but I think that that will come to light sooner than later. I think that is it, one of the parts of the investigation. No, I still, like, I mean, Absolutely. I mean, could have ended up being an attorney, correct? I mean, it was, it was, we couldn't see it because, well, we couldn't see it because it is in the redacted polygraph, mm -hmm. but it is in the redacted polygraph. So there is a record of them asking about this unnamed co defendant. You think so, that's the attorney they alluded to? And yes. Found? Yes. Wow. Absolutely. I think that's the same person. So, so that's one part of this, this puzzle that has not come together yet for us. But does that kind of get to what you're yep. talking about as far as the six million goes? Mm -hmm. um, six million missing. He talked about it again, Murdoch, when he, he got an opportunity to speak too. talked about how he became the worst thing that he always hated about other people, which is a hypocrite. Right. Now he's a hypocrite. Um, on top of the other few right. other names that we could probably right. throw out there. Right. 
Right. Um, so right. he talked about how bad he felt and he would have never done this if he hadn't been addicted to opioids, mm -hmm. which immediately they called out and said, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is that Griffin talked about in, in the attorney, Jim Griffin defense talked about, you know, uh, how this was a turf war going on between oh, state yeah. and well, federal. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, he immediately started off with, this is a turf war. We don't need to worry about this. This is just this the 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 feds wanting to get their pound of flesh for what happened as well. And Emily Limehouse had just such a such an important card to play there. I thought when she said, "Hold on, there are eleven victims mm -hmm. who are have not been named in the state financials. One point three million dollars um, that we know of, mm -hmm. and that doesn't even go into the whole six mm -hmm. million. You know." Um, 11 victims right. that had never they gotten their day in court. Mm -hmm. And she said, that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. This is, you know. That was a big comeback. And did, didn't you sort of, um, um, the defendant stood up and Judge Gnocco said, take as much time as you like. Didn't you sort of groan yourself up? Oh no, I hope this is another right. 40 minute or so. That's exactly what I looked back at that today and that went on for 45 minutes last mm -hmm. time where we had to have this weird back and forth right. between him and mm -hmm. trying to talk to the people that he had mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. looted from. Right. This was about 20 minutes, wasn't it? He didn't turn to any victims or something. It wasn't yeah. quite as long, but it had the same elements of being and, like insincere to me. And we had in the courtroom with us, so we had the Pinkneys who we heard from mm -hmm. later. Justin Bamberg mm -hmm. was there. Mm -hmm. Eric Bland was there representing the Satterfields, right. who also, Tony Satterfield, Gloria Satterfield's son was also there mm -hmm. to represent some of the financial mm -hmm. fraud victims. Um, then you see this whole line of lawyers from PMPED. Yes. I mean, they all came. They were not what happy. were they doing there? They well, just they wanted were victims, to make sure. You know, well, weren't they victims, right? Th they, they are. They chose not to speak, as I recall. Right? And, and they chose not to speak. I didn't hear them get up. Even though the judge said he didn't want to hear from lawyers, he wanted to hear from actual victims. But they would have been actual victims, and I... I think they wisely decided not to I like and, and Lafitte was there, the dad. Yes, Charlie Lafitte. Oh, mm -hmm. Charlie Lafitte mm -hmm. was there. Um, who else showed up? And they, so literally on one side, is it these federal courtrooms are small compared mm -hmm. to what mm -hmm. you know everybody's used to seeing during the Murdoch murder trial. Mm -hmm. um, these are much smaller rooms. Mm -hmm. We got a larger room, I guess. They, they, they held a larger room for us because Girdle's normal room is even smaller from mm -hmm. what I gather. Mm -hmm. And that whole side was taken up pretty much by victims. By victims, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I will say, speaking about the, the lawyers, if it's all, all former law firm, you, I know some people don't feel sympathy to them. I really felt sorry for them. I felt like- Yeah, they, no, they, I they, do. They, I was... felt like that they um, suffered a lot and, I know and they paid think, out too. They did. And people think, and I don't know the ins and outs of this, but they think they should have found things out earlier. I don't know, but I did feel sorry for them being in the courtroom with them because it really looked like they, they suffered. Well, I do too, and it was interesting that they were all there. It's almost like playing a game of Clue mm -hmm. because you know that there's this unnamed co defendant mm -hmm. who's a lawyer. Right. <laughs> yeah. And you're looking over here, and you've got this bank of lawyers right. who, uh, who he worked with through this whole. True. Terrible period. Right. Um, yet you know they're they're come. They wouldn't be there if they were worried, right? No, no, yeah. no. They, they, they are. They were victims. They are truly mm -hmm. victims mm -hmm. in what what mm -hmm. occurred. They're gonna suffer a lot if you start thinking about it, because the firm was disbanded, correct? Yeah. And they paid out all this money, and you just have to think from a from a reputational standpoint. I, I know he's the one that's pled guilty. He's the one who's done it, but it it, it must have been tough for them. It is tough. But one thing, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry that I missed seeing Judge Gerbel in action. Uh, and I, I would like to, I, I understand so many of you listening and watching, uh, you don't get to see him because it is federal court cam where cameras aren't allowed. You, you don't get to see his demeanor on the bench and the way he runs his courtroom and the way he interacts with the people in his courtroom. And, and I just, it's... Will you say uh, a Judge Clifton Newman as a frame of reference, or uh, uh, Justice Gene Toll, who, who names we've seen before, using them and what you understand about them and as a baseline? Judge Gurgle, to me, he, he's he's an interesting 
dichotomy of how quick tempered is not the right word, but he's he he goes up and down very quickly, and it, it's in, in an effective way mm -hmm. to where you when you start coming at him with some baloney, shall we say? He is very quick. He, he'll, he'll raise his voice a little bit, and he'll, and he'll you can just see it, that brow furrow, and he's looking down at you over his glasses, and he and he gets he gets very very impatient with. Nonsense. nonsense and then he'll turn right around and he'll just look at you with a big grin and the kindest eyes and the most soft-spoken and the, it's just it's always very entertaining to me to see how quickly he, he can turn it on when somebody is just wasting his time and I, I i just wish i could have seen that in in the flesh uh one last time especially for this it, it is because to stay on that topic the pound of flesh that the federal government is getting here from murdoch i it, it, there's you hear somebody like Jim say, oh, it's a turf war. Okay, well, what 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 is the state got to be upset about here? They just got a they just got a backstop. They just got a right. they got a, a, a fail safe. They got forty years. He's not getting out of prison now, alive, no matter what. It would be entirely highly unlikely for him yeah. to sur to get out alive. Good point. Yeah, and Judge Gergel did have a good comeback, I thought. said, well, they're separate sovereigns. They have their own interests to play. And, to, and Emily Limehouse came up with, I thought, really good policy reasons that she yeah. talked about. So that, that that point didn't really go anywhere. He threw it out there, turf war, went nowhere. Well, and to, the, to your point, like, when, you know, one of the things was he was, he wanted this to go the way he wanted it to go. Like, Gergel had a plan as we went in and as we were listening to the victims, because of course the victims have a right to right. to speak. The lawyers did not in this one from the former PMPED, but we did hear from Tony Satterfield. We, we did mm -hmm. hear from Ms. Peakney. They did ask to speak to him directly to Alec Murdoch. So they turned around and talked to him. It was very brief. Mm -hmm. They didn't go on. They talked about, once again, we heard some of the same things we heard in the state uh, sentencing, which was words of forgiveness mm -hmm. and hoping that he mm -hmm. kind of makes peace however however he can one group though that was not allowed to speak really were the lawyers who represent them so that he cut off that whole part of it mm -hmm. for the federal court it was not about the lawyers that had worked tirelessly mm -hmm. for their clients these victims but at the same time did not want to hear from them just wanted to hear from the victims mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. but that short then of that, the, um, I think the time for the sentencing. It did. It did. And one other interesting legal point that came up too, and talking about being quick winded, Judge Gerbil, the government talked about we're asking for the statutory max of 30 years. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, one of those crimes had a statutory max of 30. But Judge Gerbil quickly said, well, you, you can run others consecutive, can't you? So there isn't a max of 30, because he had in his mind, I think, going to 40. Which they, of course, they had to agree with that you could could run these on top. You wouldn't be limited by the thirty, and he did it. He gave forty instead of thirty. He stacked on like a hundred and twenty. Is that? I think what he ended up doing. I haven't read his order, but what he ended up doing is, yes, in a year, yes. forty years time, whatever that is, for twelve months, and a little little backdrop on on the, on the federal sentencing which is completely different than state you start with the sentencing guideline which under a case called booker which is not mandatory but the judges typically they have them as a reference and of course guidelines that like came up to about 20 years or so in the guidelines does it sound about right yeah so i'm looking at it right now i've got this is this is the way it came down to the very bottom mm -hmm. so it was 360 months for conspiracy to commit wire fraud and bank fraud two counts of wire fraud affecting a financial, all running concurrently, 240 months for conspiracy to commit wire fraud, and then 120 months for 14 counts of money laundering to run concurrently to each other, consecutive to the 360 and 250 months. And of course, you can't, if you plead to one crime and the statutory max is five years, even if the guidelines are six, of course, you can't go to six, you limit it to five. Right. So he made the point that, oh no, I go much above thirty, and he did it, and he went. Again, he, it's called a variance. You know, there's, there's something called downward departures that are in the sentencing guidelines. There's a specific thing that you can do. A variance is just a general way to get above the guidelines that's not listed in the sentencing guidelines handbook, so to speak. So he 
let them know ahead of time. I want, I'm looking at a variance. Boyd A. Very. <laughs> it's almost like a double, I believe. Yep. So, it, six M's. It, if I'm doing my very rudimentary math correctly, it will, in essence, add an, an additional 12 years to his state sentence. His state sentence was 27, 85 percent parole eligibility. That's 22. 40, 85 percent of 40 is somewhere. So he's looking at about 34 years. Mm -hmm. 34 years, it feels like at least. And I, now I'm defer to you on how that works with 85, the 85 percent rules, the truth and sentencing rules uh, before parole eligibility. So. Well, and, and how does it affect if you've got a convicted killer? I mean, did, did, can you right. do this? Yeah. So <laughs> it's like, He's been I guess it's not like a catch-22, really. Yeah. Like, if he got out of the convictions, right. then then he's not a convicted killer anymore, right? right. So then you're right. not looking at that when he goes in for his federal time. Yeah, and, but he, at that point in time, he's in state court under the 85% uh, no parole we have in, in, in South Carolina. So he's looking at a long stretch there. Mm -hmm. So if by some, you know, he lives that long, gets out, he's got this massive federal sentence waiting for him. And by the way, did you um, get a chance to really look at the defendant when the sentence was announced? But I didn't catch much of a reaction by him. Did you see much in the way of he was stoic when you saw him? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I would have expected a little bit more, but no. I mean, I, I think that, this, and this is what I, I've heard from the defense again, is he is ready to, you know, pay his penance for what he did in these financial crimes. Mm -hmm. He does not want to go down for these murder convictions. Mm -hmm. And that needs to, that's what they're going to mm -hmm. keep, you know, ringing the bell on. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to keep on hearing right. about to okay. some degree. And no families there too. I thought that was... No family. Noteworthy. Yeah, well, and no Dick Carpillion. Yep. You ever find out about that? I did. It, I, from what I understand, it was mm -hmm. a conflict. Um, there was just a conflict in the schedule, so he was not able to be there. But I did ask if he planned to be at the appeals going forward mm -hmm. for these murder convictions, and I have been told, yes, absolutely. I see. They, so he will keep on going. They do intend to continue representing him. I, that was included in... There was a filing. So one of the lingering... Oh, one of the lingering leftover unresolved things that's still happening is there are some outs there's at least one outstanding civil case uh in the federal uh federal jurisdiction with the nautilus insurance uh that is still being litigated and uh last week after the sentencing uh murdoch attorneys griffin and harpootlian filed a uh filed a default in that case uh they're they're saying we were he's going to be in prison forever and we have no means of recovering any of the money he has no means of gaining an income and we're not going to be able to pay any judgment in this so just find us in default uh but they did say in that filing um that they will continue to represent him and continue to be answer whatever is needed to to be answered so yeah um also, is it Jim? Is it Jim Griffin the one with the federal experience? Like the so, I guess that kind of makes sense. If you can't reasonably expect them to both be there every single time, and I feel like that's not the first time we've had a we've had a hearing where I think there was, was one. Was that right? Was that, that other hearings? Were, well, it was just that this one was like so so big. Final. Yeah, so big. I mean, this is the one where he just right. they, and didn't they, they show lock up? the door and throw away the key, yeah. and I'm like, hold yeah. on, yeah. where is everybody? Didn't they all show up to when they just went in there for like an arraignment? Mm -hmm. I remember that. They, they did. did. No, yeah. at the last, yes, at the last one that we were in federal court, they had. Back in September. Uh, yeah, Dick, Dick yeah. was there. So I, I, so I was surprised, but mm -hmm. I did ask, and I was told it was just merely a conflict, and that that would be not the case going forward with the appeal, so that they would be able to get there. But yeah, it is also, I do think it is also partly, who, and, and what is Gergel and Harpootlian's relationship? I mean, the last time it was awful, right? I don't think it went that great. No, I wasn't it? there, really. I it did it go that well? well. I, it, it doesn't stick out, to, it doesn't stick out no. to me as being particularly bad or good, no one with it or so, but that, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, I can, <laughs> there's, I've, I've been to, this is the first Murdoch hearing I didn't attend personally in, 
Three years? Yeah. Uh, so, so, wow. yeah. And so, so you and Dick were, where were, what about uh, you and Dick were both absent? <laughs> <laughs> oh, for all of those uh, conspiracy theories out there, Drew Trepp and Dick Harpoolian missed so, the same Murdoch hearing. So uh, to, that, to that note, um, to that note, the last time I saw, I saw Dick at the, um, uh, the hearing in Columbia uh, back in or the uh, retrial hearing, um, I was talking to him afterward, and I've, like I said, been to as many of these press conferences and court hearings as anybody else. And I'm talking to him afterward, and he goes, and who are you again? Who are you with? And I'm like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> It's not how I wish you. I don't know why that's possible. Yeah, just standing head and shoulders above everybody there and have, put the hat on. Ha hat on and half again as wide as the rest of them, too. Uh, uh, anyway, yeah, well, I, I, I guess we can, as we're kind of wrapping up here, I, I can address that a little. As a, I'm, I've already uh, started a new job. Uh, I'm here on loan to help out with this. Uh, I'm still. Working with Ann, still based here in Charleston, uh, still around, still going to have my finger on the pulse of well, the, the Murdoch stuff to, to an extent, but I, I'm not working for our, we're based with WCIV, ABC News 4 here in Charleston, so um, I'm not working for News 4 full-time anymore, but I'm, I'm still around, still around, still. Congratulations on that. Yeah, congratulations. congratulations. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, uh, I can't get too much into this just yet, but I'm... Uh, I'm going to be a, a producer on a, a new a new venture, um, and I'll be able to uh, talk more about that soon enough. Um, and uh, Charlie, you, you remember this, and you remember this. I, you, you asked me last year about this time, was I going to CrimeCon? And I said I wouldn't be caught dead at CrimeCon. <laughs> but I'm going to be at CrimeCon this year. <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, that's coming up. Yeah, Crime Con coming up in, in Nashville and uh, coming up in the end of May, the first part of June. So I will be there this year and we'll have some more information on what I'm doing. Then. In other words, uh, D Drew will still have his finger on the pulse on not only Murdoch, but plenty of other things going on related um, to crime, and more murder and mayhem that, that <laughs> happens to be crime that may or may not be true. It, it, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, exactly. We'll we'll, uh, we'll 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 get there. But um. Well, great. Well, yeah. So we've still got a few uh, things hanging out for that we're going to have to keep an eye on. We need to see who this unnamed co-defendant is and how that's going to relate to these other crimes. We have a new date of when these crimes, according to the prosecution, started. The feds have said now that it goes back to 2005. Wow. Is, is, the grand, is the federal I mean, grand jury Was he still, barely out of law school by then? I mean, it's the, ridiculous. Is the grand jury still operating the federal grand jury on, on, on the um, situation? The federal grand mm -hmm. jury? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think that they're still... Uh, they're certainly still looking. They must be, right? Because they're, they're still looking for that money. And they're not going to stop because I think they even asked the question, what are you going to do about that money? And they said, well, we need to try. And we didn't even talk about the amount of money that they called for the restitution mm -hmm. for these federal victims was uh, upwards of $8.7 million. So $8.7 million, where is that going to come from? And they're hoping that somehow they're going to open the vault somehow and get the $6 million out. They, I think they truly do believe that that money is missing. They can find, they can buy the different. It's missing. That's so, right. I mean, and you know, after doing the work two years ago on this case, when we were looking at mm -hmm. some of the, some of the related cases that have since been adjudicated, you know, we do know that there are, there were opportunities possibly for that money um, within, within all of that. Yeah. So, yeah. so I assume that's yeah. what they're still looking yeah. at. Is that vague enough? I, I, no, no, no. I don't want to name any names right now, but... You're to, switching subjects a little bit. Becky Hill, been following that? I, I was there. That was the last official thing I, I think, attended uh, was the Becky Hill press conference uh, in Walterboro announcing her resignation. Um, I, based on all the information I've gotten and the what's public knowledge at this point, I think it's very unlikely that she does not face at least one criminal charge 
um, and whether that be a mm. misdemeanor or type of thing where you should, it's just a short term of probation and nothing else, I, who knows? Um, I, but yeah, I was, I was there at the press conference and they were adamant um, as she announced her effective immediately re resignation from the clerk of court's office that she it was not had nothing at all to do with the two current criminal investigations she's the subject of uh, one related to the jury tampering and the two related to abuse of uh, public office for personal gain um I, if i'm guessing i pure speculation pure guessing i i'm thinking the abuse of a public office for personal gain is probably the one we may see some movement in. Um, just because I, I don't know, it just feels to me like while SLED still says that it is an active and ongoing investigation for the jury tampering, that feels kind of, I don't know, final. Uh, it, and because of I, what happened with Justice Toll? Because of what happened with Justice Toll. I, I mean, it, and it, I, Right. I, I don't know. It, it, it could be, could be more. But then you've got to still have, you've got to have some sort of consensus from these other jurors. And there was, that was the point the whole time is there was a broad consensus that she didn't do anything to influence their verdict, uh, intentionally or unintentionally. I, I think that's, I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm just reading the room. I have no expertise whatsoever to uh, really uh, speculate on a, a good reason for that. It just just has a little bit of a gut feeling there. So I think uh, because then the other thing you still got is her son uh, is facing a pending grand jury indictment for uh, wiretapping. And we know we know it to be the case that that was done. According to what investigators have found, that was done in order to gain information for her. I can't say definitively that she was directing his moves, but she was somehow benefiting from his behaviors then it's hard to separate the two at least if you're at least in my mind if you're an investigator you'd be looking down that avenue pretty pretty intently gazing down that possibility but what about the appeals as far as his appeals go how how do we see this play out like if they reject his appeal on the south carolina supreme court level they they could be back in federal court with that, right? They could be in U.S. Supreme they, Court. They don't want to it plain that they're going to try and get the federal court on some sort of federal ground. I don't know. I'm assuming I have to think that one through. How they would have an effective ground because it does seem like most of the issues are a matter of state law. Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming they can find some way to, oh. to get in there. There was a, a there was ground. an amendment issue, right? Weren't they looking at his whether or not his rights were violated? Because it was, but maybe that was because of the jury tampering. Is mm -hmm. that what they were sort of? I guess looking? be that. I guess be some sort of. Uh, yeah, uh, that that could be the way they. I, mean, I just think their best shot is going to be a state court appeal, personally, just because of the. It was unusual the amount of, 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 of the white. I mean, all the financial stuff that was in the murder case. That's unusual. Mm -hmm. Thinking that's their main grounds. The judge didn't let that all in versus just some of it or none of it. He let it all come in. We had. About a couple of weeks of information yeah. at, at the jury trial and financial matters right. as, as a basis. I like his ruling was it was went to, to the motive, as I recall. So that's going to be, I think, a main issue, and that's going to be interesting to see how our high court rules on that. But it could take a long time. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, I have a little bit of uh, experience with this. I mean, it's they don't really have a set schedule. Right. So sometimes it's pretty fast, and sometimes it's pretty long. I would guesstimate on a case like this, the year or so, we have a ruling. Am I afraid to say? Just to, I, I can give a basic, uh, from what I see, re getting the weekly digests and alerts from the state court's mm -hmm. uh, office, it's not at all uncommon to see a case argued in October. Uh, argued in front of the pa appeals panel or the Supreme Court, say you'll have an argument, you have oral arguments in October, and they'll issue a ruling in April or May or March, somewhere along there. So the next year. of the next year, it, it could be, and that's after the case has been at appeal for <laughs> already a year or more before they right. even get to oral arguments. So it, it it could be a long time before the 
Murdoch's nerve repeal gets, um, we get any significant movement there. I, I just, uh, and on that note, we also have, there's still, um, still dangling out there is his co-conspirator, uh, Corey Fleming, his appeal of, appeal of his pleaded, uh, his negotiated mm. plea, uh, sentence and, uh, plea agreement. Um, he's appealing that, uh, saying judge Newman was biased and too harsh. Mm. Uh, and then there's Russell Lafitte who has not been charged or who has not been tried in state court, but he's still, he's still, he's still got his federal appeal pending. And that just at the end of March, the federal government, uh, filed their response to his appeal and their cross appeal. Um, uh, in, in that case, uh, going after more restitution, uh, basically interest on the restitution uh, that they feel Lafitte should owe. And that I believe Judge Gerber did not order interest on uh, some of what he owed right. um, in his sentencing. But so that's coming up in, yeah, it, we're, we're going to start thinking in years now and not weeks and days and months. Uh, so a lot of stuff to still. Yeah, and of course, it's the Murdoch case, so um, I'll see y'all next week, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, we're still waiting on that other killer, that uh, that other, the, the yeah, real killer. Yeah, where's the empty that chair? Jim Where's Griffin our empty and, chair theory, uh, right? Dick Harpootley and the uh, teased at the, uh, at the retrial hearing back in January. Still waiting on that. Well, we'll certainly keep everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll keep our ear to the ground, of course, as this, this carries on. There are plenty of opportunities to update this story over the next months and years. So um, we've been doing it for three years for you guys. So we will keep on uh, letting you know what's going on with it. But in the meantime, uh, for now, I want to say thank you so much. Max Harrison, our chief photographer here at CIV, has been taking care of the camera production, the music that you love, all of that, which has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Charlie Condon, My pleasure. Uh, our exclusive legal analyst here. We are so lucky to have your expertise, to have him next to me in that courtroom and to be able to walk out and take it apart. It's just been invaluable. Drew Tripp, such a joy. So excited to see what you do next. But uh, know that um, I will absolutely be not rapping hard on your door if something <laughs> happens with Murdoch because I know they're all, it's not just me, it's not my fault. There's a bunch of people out there that want to hear what you have to say about it. So we'll keep you all up to speed. I'm Ann Emerson. So for now, Unsolved South Carolina, the Murdoch's Murders, Money and Mystery. We will talk to you soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm.